Uh, so thanks very much for having me here. Standard disclaimer, this presentation does not reflect the views of the U.S. Naval War College, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. So I, I've been asked to talk today about cultural awareness, and hey, presto, um, I've just written a book on the subject, and it's coming out this fall. That's mm -hmm. my shameless plug. Um, and it captures more or less what I've learned working for the U.S. Army, the U.S. Navy, and the U.S. intelligence community for the fast, past 15 years. So um, the guy on the left here is Major Tom Harrison, who is an OSS commander in Borneo during the Second World War with a Dayak chieftain. And I want you all to just look at that picture and notice, if you can, that Harrison is wearing a sarong and uh, native jewelry, and he's barefoot. And his friend there, the chieftain, is wearing an army shirt and army boots. So this is a really great example of going native, which is sort of the extreme version of cultural awareness. So the basic argument in the book, and what I'm just going to talk about quickly today, is that culture matters in war. But in some situations, it matters a lot more. Uh, and I'll give you four reasons very quickly why that's true. So <clears throat> the first is that military organizations pay more attention to culture when they engage with an adversary or a civilian population that is culturally distant. Second, cultural knowledge becomes more important when the military is operating in close contact with either civil society um, or another military in a foreign country. It's in these contexts that understanding the values, the beliefs, the norms, the identity, the social organization contribute to the military's ability to achieve its objectives. Third, cultural knowledge matters more when firepower is limited, whether by doctrine, strategy, laws of war, or political concerns. As anthropologist Kevin Avrock once noted, shock and awe makes cultural knowledge irrelevant. And fourth, cultural knowledge matters more when the strategic objective is not primarily military. So if your objective is primarily military, say the complete destruction of enemy forces, then it hardly matters if populations are decimated, crops are destroyed, etc. Uh, such was the case in the 1980 to 88 conventional war between Iran and Iraq. If, however, the object beyond war is some kind of socio-political outcome, for example, a stable society in Iraq, which was the US objective, then the host nation society has to be taken into, the, into account in development of strategy and in the conduct of operations. So even when military organizations recognize the value of understanding opposing forces and host nation societies, they inevitably face impediments when it comes to acquiring, managing, disseminating, and utilizing this knowledge at the sharp end of the foreign policy sphere. In a 2013 speech, Lieutenant General Charles Cleveland, the then commander of U.S. Army Special Operations Command, opined that, and I'm quoting him, the nature of the current conflict is that we are contesting in non-declared combat zones. What dot mil PF do you need to fight in these places? In the land domain, the focus has been on tanks and other heavy stuff. Humans have been treated as a lesser case. The problem in Afghanistan and Iraq was that we didn't have the right kinds of structures and knowledge to deal with the human domain. Right? So why is that so hard? <clears throat> First, the complexity problem. So in the summer of 2009, General Stanley McChrystal was shown a slide produced by the Office of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And disclaimer, I helped to work on this slide, so I'm partially guilty for this. Um, showing the military's plan for Afghanistan stability, coin dynamics, security. This slide attempted to capture all the political, economic, criminal, environmental, and military dynamics in Afghanistan and the interrelations between them. And that's the slide right there. And when we understand that slide, we'll have won the war, said McChrystal. So his witty comment, it captures really a fundamental truth. Whether fought hundreds of years ago or today with sticks or clubs or rocket-propelled grenades, war has always been a complex human undertaking. And the complexity of war is magnified when it's fought in a foreign environment where soldiers have to grapple with adversaries and host nation populations whose language, religion, customs, and social organization differ from their own. We are absolute newcomers to this environment, said one young officer that I interviewed in Iraq. It's so foreign to us, you couldn't pick a place in the world that would be more foreign to most Americans than Iraq. 
So second, the epistemology problem. And we've talked a little bit about this over the course of the conference, so I remind you of that now. Because constantly, increasingly, uh, complexity and information overload have become an almost universal condition of humanity. Individuals almost everywhere reduce complexity and solve problems through the use of schemas, models, and heuristics. That is, they employ their own knowledge and their experience in the form of educated guesses, trial and error, and common sense to solve problems. Categories, frames, and rules of thumb do indeed simplify complexity, but they come at a price. The heuristics that enable, enable the military to execute incredibly complex tasks also limit perception and therefore understanding of other human beings. And this is the epistemology problem. And I'll give you just one example of such a scheme or assumption. That is universalism, the belief that other people are or want to be fundamentally just like us. Um, American foreign policy un operates under the traditional assumption that our primary norms and values are, in theory, valid everywhere. Thus, for the past 60 years, we've been engaged in building an international legal system and developing international institutions that reflect, quote unquote, universally accepted principles such as civil liberties, democracy, and human rights. For example, there was a tendency among promoters of the 2003 to 2011 Iraq war as Francis Fukuyama observed, to believe that democracy was the default condition to which societies would revert once liberated from dictators. And this is obviously incorrect, and operating with such assumptions gets you into a strategic trouble. Third, the way of war problem. So even when you're seeking to understand adversaries and host nation population, um, you might often discover that the culture of your own organization creates barriers to understanding. So one afternoon in a class that I was teaching at the Naval War College, the discussion turned to the apparent inability of the US military to conduct counterinsurgency operations. And one of the students who was an army lieutenant colonel with a lot of tours in Iraq and Afghanistan observed that. And I, I just thought this was so beautiful the way he phrased it. He said, our solve is based on the idea of their end state. Our own culture gets in the way of understanding what other people believe is their solve. In other words, US forces come into theater with mission objectives and their own preconceived ideas about how to complete those tasks. Rarely, if ever, do US military commanders, and maybe Canadian, maybe NATO too, um, ask the host population, host nation population, what are your objectives and how can we achieve them? And the reason for the omission of these questions is not a lack of training, inappropriate force structure, battle rhythm, or any number of other potential variables, but military culture itself. The way of war problem is the inability of the American military personnel to understand the world from the subjective viewpoint of another culture and the corresponding tendency to impose predetermined solutions on other people. Fourth, the social theory problem. Yeah, I'm giving you all the bad news. <laughs> um, even if a military officer felt comfortable with complexity, found a way to slow the fire hose of battle space information to a trickle, found time to think slowly without overly relying on heuristics, was able to hear the solutions that other people had discovered for themselves, that officer would encounter yet another problem, uh, which is no two people, least of all anthropologists, agree what culture is or sometimes even whether it exists. Um, if the military wanted to really understand the operational environment using academic social science, they would be hard pressed to find concepts that could be put into practice operationally. And this is the social theory problem. Um, so in my experience, having been through this rodeo a couple of times, the military was really left to develop their own theories about how society worked in the absence of input from social science. Unfortunately, the Intel system was also not set up to conduct social science research, and the order of battle approach to the human terrain was flatly inadequate. And as one young army officer put it, I could have read Lonely Planet and had a better idea of what was going on in Hellman than I got from our IPB. Fifth, the policy implementation problem. So suppose our young officer has overcome all these impediments and has somehow located a suitable model of culture that he or she can employ productively downrange. 
Now the real problem begins, <clears throat> actually implementing U.S. foreign policy at the point of a gun. As our young officer will no doubt discover, national security policies crafted with the best intentions often have the worst results. The long-term strategic objective in Vietnam, for example, was an independent, non-communist country, quote unquote, yet exporting a Western political model to an East Asian society was less than successful. The goal in Iraq was a more, uh, the goal in Iraq was also stability and democracy, yet the presence of coalition forces resulted in more instability, locally, nationally, and regionally. So the point here is that the most optimistic foreign policy goals, equality for women, economic development, political liberty, often seem to result during the implementation phase in unintended consequences, operational paradoxes, and unmitigated disaster. And why is it so difficult to implement foreign policy? And I'm going to quote Friedrich Engels to you, which I think will be a first here at KCIS. <laughs> um, he wrote regarding the flow of history, quote, there are innumerable intersecting forces, an infinite series of parallelograms of forces which give rise to the one resultant, the historical event. For what each individual wills is obstructed by everyone else. What emerges is something that no one willed. And three problems are there. The first danger is exporting Western models. I'm just going to give you these really quickly. Um, this is transposition of social, political, and economic frameworks and concepts into societies that don't possess those concepts or don't possess them in the same form. So during the British colonial administration of Fiji, for example, the indigenous prestige economy in which a chief's prestige and power was linked to his generosity in distributing foods and goods was replaced with small peasant production, monetization, and thrifty habits modeled on British cultural norms. And this basically destroyed the society of Fiji. Second, um, errors of perception. So the heuristics that I was talking about earlier that enabled the military to execute incredibly complex tasks also limit perception and understanding of human beings. And when military personnel don't see clearly the world in front of them, their skewed assessment of reality will result in plans and decisions that solve problems that do not exist or create new problems that do not need to exist. At a June 2003 press conference regarding the situation in Iraq, for example, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld stated, I guess the reason I don't use the phrase guerrilla warfare is because there isn't one. Of course, by June 2003, there was already a full-blown insurgency brewing, and the estimates were that there were 40 to 50,000 insurgent fighters in the country, um, which was actually larger than the military force in Iraq at that time. So the third uh, danger here with foreign policy implementation is self-defeating praxis or the choice of a strategy that unintentionally sabotages the overall objective. And policy wonks sometimes call this blowback. So that's sort of the bad news for now. Um, over and over again, almost regardless of time and place, military organizations encounter similar barriers in implementing foreign policy in foreign societies. The problems of complexity, epistemology, way of war, social theory, and policy implementation hamper attempts to reach long and short-term objectives. It would be easy, given this list of intertwined impediments, to come to the conclusion that the task is pure hubris and should not be undertaken. Yet the history of the US clearly demonstrates that even at moments like the present, when the attention in the Pentagon has turned away from counterinsurgency and small wars, that these tasks require knowledge of other human beings will never fully abate. So in a sense, the book and the stories it contains, stories like the OSS commander whose photo I showed you on the first slide, come with an inherent warning regarding the difficulty of the task. Yet these stories also contain some guidance about what can be done based on what has been done that may prove valuable when it comes time to decide again what should be done. Thank you.